Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Geek Show Off. Would you please go absolutely crazy, clap and cheer and make an incredible wall of noise for your host, Steve Cross! <laughs> Too much smoke. <clears throat> Hello everyone. Give me a cheer if you're a geek. Give me a cheer if you're a nerd! Give me a cheer if you're from the United Kingdom and technically the term SWAT would be more appropriate. Because I tell you, it is not geek that people used to shout when they were kicking the shit out of me at school because it hadn't got over the Atlantic yet. Hello everyone, welcome. It's fine, we're safe here, we're all geeks together. My name is Steve Cross, I am a geek comedian. By geek comedian, I mean that I go all around the country doing gigs like this for really clever people, and then really clever people chat me up after those gigs. And I have to say, I love geeks. A geek came up to me in Edinburgh after a fringe gig, and she said, you look like a number of famous people, but none enough for me to say a name. That was amazing. I had another really, really, really drunk geek came up to me after a gig in Loughborough and just went, I want to fuck your glasses. (laughs) Awkward. So awkward. Because the thing is, right, they predate the invention of the spring-loaded hinge and are therefore very fragile. Uh, right, so uh, what you're going to see tonight, this is, this is a gig that I run called Geek Show Off, where basically I invite loads of my mates to just come on a stage, one after another, and be brilliantly entertaining about whatever the fuck they want. And it makes me so happy to be able to do it for you guys. I have to say, uh, I'm only here for the day. You know, this is my first EMF camp. I don't really understand it yet. So there is a question I just want to check with all of you. Right? Because I've been around and looking, and you're making quite a lot, and I don't understand it, and it frightens me. Just answer this. Are you a cult, and are you building a doomsday device? <laughs> yes! I thought it was. I, even the people hammering the rings, I was like, they're hammering those very specifically. <laughs> as if as some kind of fuel is going to be sprayed through a few of those. I knew it. I knew it. I should have gone with it. Give me a cheer if you were here for Simon Singh. Simon's amazing. Simon and I did a gig a couple of weeks ago, right? You think, you're sitting there thinking, we're the geekiest audience Steve has ever played to. Two weeks ago, Simon Singh and I did a gig for the World Conference of Wikipedia Editors. (laughs) Not a lie. It's called Wikimania. We did it in the main room of the Barbican. Like, so two and a half thousand seats. I won't tell you how many of them had people in, because it's less impressive. (laughs) The point, the point of this gig, right, it was called Wikipedia, The Missing Bits. So Simon talked about how actually there is a page on Wikipedia about maths in The Simpsons, but it's woefully inadequate and doesn't have all of the examples from his book. And when they asked me, they were like, Steve, do you want to do ten minutes on anything that you should think should be in Wikipedia? I thought, well, hmm, I'm a narcissist, so me. So I went in front of these 400 Wikipedia editors and did a 10-minute rant about the fact that I should have a Wikipedia page. So much fun. There's, like, I held up my 1,000-metre swimming badge I got when I was 15. Because I was like, here's the citation. I've actually got this. I know you can buy them on eBay for like £1.50 because I did think about upgrading to 2,000 for the gig. But no. Um, and so uh, they, they made me a Wikipedia page during my set and then one of them deleted it during my set. <laughs> the thing is, right, he was, he was totally right to delete it because it just read, Steve Cross is an accomplished performer, citation needed, <laughs> but may have peaked early, <laughs> citation needed. <laughs> So it got deleted, then somebody rewrote it as Steve Cross with a lowercase c, because that tricks Wikipedia into thinking you're a different person, and someone else deleted it again, all in the space of a 10-minute set on stage. 
So I, the, the thing is, after all of this, I got them all so excited and so angry. There are full of there are talk pages full of people going. I don't see why someone should have a Wikipedia page just for doing ten minutes at Wikimania. Uh, but I now have an actual proper Wikipedia page, and I'm very proud of it because the reason I wanted a Wikipedia page is that I have, sadly, and I want sympathy for this, recently become single. I know. And the thing is, right, there's a wonderful new thing, because I've been in a relationship for a few years, this thing didn't exist. There's a wonderful thing called Tinder. Are any of you on Tinder by cheering? I thought I did... On your own. I'm sorry, but you wouldn't get picked up by my Tinder settings. Uh, so what I do is, like, I use Tinder as if it was Grindr. So I set it to one kilometre. I'm basically looking for anyone who is in the same building as me. But... The thing about Tinder is that you, you don't get very much space for text. You get a big picture of your face and not very much space for text. And I thought, how can I use this space most efficiently linked to my Wikipedia page? <laughs> that was the only reason I wanted one. But the trouble is now, right, I go on Tinder and I've got a Wikipedia page and I'm like, I'm not sure I want to date anyone who hasn't got a Wikipedia page. <laughs> So uh, I put this in an email to Jimmy Wales from Wikipedia. The email read, please could you add dating yeah, is, functionality to Wikipedia <laughs> so that I can use my page as a no, profile again, and match with other people that I like on Wikipedia. And then as I thought for a minute, that'd be nice. Turn your phone on in the morning, you fire it up, go to Wikipedia dating. By the way, it's Wikipedia dating. Anyone who heard any other pronunciations, it's definitely not that. Uh, I go to Wikipedia dating and it would be like, bing, you have three matches. You're like, oh, that's very nice. I've got three matches on Wikipedia dating. Match number one, Scarlett Johansson. Oh, that's very nice. Match number two, Karen Gillan. Oh, that's very good as well. Match number three, the Taco Bell Corporation of North America. <laughs> Slightly disappointing. Uh, I, I do recommend to any of you to go and visit my Wikipedia page, uh, which really, I think, actually now needs a link to the Wikipedia page okay. for passive aggression. Especially if you go on the talk pages. Like, I'll give you an example. My, my Wikipedia page is two lines and five references. Like, there's bugger all on it. But people fight like crazy. So if you went on it a week ago, it started, Steve Cross is a comedian. It now starts, Steve Cross is a self-described comedian. <laughs> people are absolutely horrible. Right. Uh, I, I'm your compere tonight, it's my job to get you clapping and cheering for all of the acts because they're coming up here late at night, they haven't had enough to drink yet, unlike me, I have had plenty. Uh, so they need loads and loads of clapping and cheering from you, so I'm going to do a quick clapping and cheering test. We're going to get your clapping and cheering levels bang on. So, first of all, we're going to do baseline clapping and cheering and we need to find out the lowest amount of clapping and cheering you can do. I'll give you a scenario. You're on a dating website, you meet a man, a woman, an other, whatever you're into, and they say, would you like to go on a date? And you say, yes, I would like to go on a date. And they say, would you like to go and see a superhero film? And you go, I like superhero films. They're very good, aren't they? They're very now. They're of the zeitgeist. Let's go and see, see, see a superhero film. And they take you to see a superhero film, but it's Green Lantern. And we're doing baseline clapping and cheering, we're not firing into it. That's good, that, that, they are crying. That's good, that's perfect. Okay, let's go for a medium amount of clapping and cheering. You go, uh, you're a data website, man, woman, other, whatever you're into, superhero, film, zeitgeist. Uh, and uh, they take you to see it, and it's Avengers, but you've already seen it. So a medium amount of clapping and cheering. That's your medium amount of clapping and cheering. You are hard, hard people. No, I love it. I love it. Right. I want you to imagine you're on a dating website. They say, do you want to come and see a film? And blah, 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 like that. And when you get there, it's not a superhero film at all. It's just a two-hour looped animated gif of Hulk punching Thor in the face over and over again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready to meet your first geek star tonight? <laughs> Please welcome to the Sydney Revolution.
Okay. Instead of front of the tire. Cool, man. Come inside the room. Come in somewhere, I have room. Okay. Uh, it has happened, that's why I'm using it as an example. Uh, you can also fly kites, um, and that's what we use today. So, trick question. So can anybody tell me when you use kites and when you use balloons? for aerial photography. Oh my god, you guys are geniuses! Yes, that too. Um, so, yep. the most important thing about Public Lab that I want to share with you is that, of course, Public Lab is a non-for-profit organization. We do sell kits, uh, but all of the stuff that we make, all the tools, all the prototypes are inclusive. We really put at the forefront that everything that we use has to be locally sourced and affordable because it's really for the people who usually won't have access, who usually are excluded, who can't leverage and, uh, and do advocacy in their favor. Um, we consider that everyone has an expertise, so you might not like to code, you might not like to take um, air photos and go out there, but you know, you like distributing flyers, you like um, drawing the pictures that animate the campaign, etc. Um, and storytelling is at the heart of this. Uh, so these are some of the pictures and some of the stuff that we've done. I do a lot of stuff with kids, but uh, to be honest, I really like adults too. Um, so I do a lot of stuff with adults too, um, in terms of kite mapping. Um, and I want to show you really quickly so this is uh, what we use today, it's a pic of it. This was not the workshop today. Uh, let's see, is this it? Yes, so if you recognize this place, so this was one of the photos that we took up uh, from one of the kites today. You recognize your car, um, and that's the EM part of the EMF camp. And um, 
that's the kind of, you can see crop circles. We have crop circles if you want to go visit them. Actually, somebody suggested that um, we do crop circles. Um, and let me see. More photos, feet, children. Gone. Oh, I skipped a slide. What I wanted to show you is a lot of people have asked me, well, you use kites and balloons, but why don't you use drones? Because they're cooler and um, you, know, you can operate them. Uh, well, for many reasons, actually. Um, one of the most important things for me is that we want to really promote openness and accountability. So a drone, you'll see one buzzing and flying around. There's a concealed operator. With a kite or a balloon, um, the thing's going around there somewhere. You have a reel, and you're attached to your kite. It's playful, it's inviting, and you're connected to your kite. And you want to connect with the communities that you're mapping, because, well, it's private property, um, and you want to create connections. Um, so um, I have to go, because my taxi is here. Um, <laughs> But I want to show you one last thing. So that's the uh, balloon mapping kits going around over there. We've hacked cameras to make them into infrared. So I would pass this around, but then I wouldn't be able to get it back in time to get my taxi. But a simple camera, just a very cheap 20 quid camera um, with a filter, very simple blue filter. You open your, up your camera, you exchange you exchange the filter inside, and you change it for a blue filter, and voila, you have a near-infrared near camera that can, you can send up, and it can help you, it can help farmers detect um, plant health and water table issues and um, solve problems with the world. So hugs and bye. <laughs>
Well, thanks, thanks. Thank you very much. You're going to feel pretty stupid about applauding just that in one moment because not only am I a scientist, ladies and gentlemen, standing before you is a Daily Mail accredited scientist. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and as such, as such, I come up with gems such as this. Customers who make mistakes are not idiots, right? That's what my PhD is. That's three or four years' work to come up with the quote, customers who make mistakes are not idiots. Oh, <laughs> that's science, though, right? You're not going to come up with an insight like that on wonders of the universe, okay? That is knowledge. Okay, anyway, 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 anyway. You got the idea. I study errors, and I really like errors. Um, but as, as a result of my interest in errors, it actually makes me a really, really bad friend. Um, and let, let me tell you why. So a few months ago, my mate, he broke up with his girlfriend. Uh, it's the usual story. She went out, got wasted, and then ended up sleeping with someone else. Um, and he was, you know, he was really cut up about it, you know? And he, he was saying to me, oh, but Sarah, she said she made a mistake. Maybe she won't do it again. And I was like, no, no, what are you thinking? You have to break up with her. Because what, what she's just done there is label a slip error as a mistake. And if she can make that type of mix-up with error terminology, <laughs> who knows what else she's capable of? That did not go down as well with him as it did with you just there, let me tell you. Okay? Okay, but, okay, I'm going to help you guys be, be, be a better friend than I am, just so that you can watch out for this type of thing. So, a slip and a mistake, they're different. Now, a slip error happens when you make the right plan in your mind, but then for whatever reason, it happens wrongly when you execute it. So, the classic example of this is the Freudian slip, where you think one thing, but you say your mother. Pause for laughter, pause for laughter. Great, cool. And then a mistake error, a mistake error is where you execute your plan perfectly well, but then for whatever reason, the plan that you actually made was wrong to begin with. So an example of a mistake would be incorrectly thinking it was an appropriate thing to lecture your friend about error terminology whilst he was going through severe emotional trauma. I learned that one. I learned that one. That was a very bad mistake on my part. Okay, let's talk about examples of errors. So I have a question for you. What, does, uh, what do bar charts and NHS data about patient record keeping have in common? The answer is... I'm about to try and make a joke with both of those, so get ready. So here we go. This data, the data I'm about to show you, is um, data that has honestly been taken from the, from the real world, from NHS records, and it was collated in a British medical journal about error. Now, I'm going to show you here a, a graph, a bar graph, of um, all of the people, uh, well, not all of the people, a subset of the people that were admitted to geriatric care between the year 2003 and 2009. Okay, geriatric care meaning care for the elderly. <laughs> there is something off about this graph. And I don't just mean the fact that I haven't labeled the x-axis, okay? I know that some of you have spotted that and think you're very clever, and I'm sorry for not, for not doing that. Now, it doesn't just happen at this end of the scale. It happens at the other end of the scale. This uh, next graph is a subset of people that were admitted to adolescent psychiatric care. <laughs> Ah. Um, no one on that graph is under the age of 30. Now, um, I know some immature people in my life, uh, <laughs> but none of them are so immature that, medically speaking, the NHS will treat them as children. So um, either, in, in these two instances, right, what's happened? Um, either a, a medical worker has, has made some stupid error when filling in uh, a, a, a patient, a, a incoming patient form, Either it's error, or it's example that Benjamin Button syndrome exists. And I think that's more likely, right? Um, and it's not just ages that this is happening with. It's not just ages. This graph is a graph uh, showing a s the number of men that were admitted to various pregnancy-related wards in, in, the, uh, in the NHS. How does that happen? <laughs> I just don't understand. Um, so again, either... Uh, an error when they were entering the data, or example uh, that, that this type of a film is more of a documentary than we ever realized, right? <laughs> right. 
Now, okay, all those examples that I just showed you um, of examples of, of error in the medical domain, they're all quite funny, really, you know. No one got hurt. Some men maybe started eating for two, but that was it, you know. Nothing bad happened, and we can have a laugh about them. But the reason I bring them up is because error in the medical domain, unfortunately, isn't always like that. I mean, you, it's not too hard to imagine, but sometimes when errors occur in the medical domain, people get hurt or, or even die, and we read about this sort of thing in the news all of the time. And so it's my job as a researcher into the design of technology to understand what happens when we make these errors. What is going on with humans when we do stupid things like this, and can the technology stop that from happening? Now, in order to answer that type of question, I need to understand more about error. And I'm a scientist, and so I like doing things in the lab. Now, there are two reasons why it's hard to study error in a lab setting, right? Number one, um, when you get people into a lab, it's quite artificial, and errors that they make, um, they're very they're not necessarily realistic. They're, it's hard to generalize to the real world. There's very low ecological validity. And the second reason that it's hard to study errors in a lab setting um, is that essentially it makes you a really terrible person because what you're doing is bringing someone into a lab, sitting in a room with them, and then just waiting for them to fail. And that's just, that's just bad for the soul, okay? I don't like doing that. Um, but luckily for us, uh, there is an example of there's a real world source of error that we can tap into. And we at UCL, uh, we have started using Twitter. Now, what we're doing is uh, we're asking people to switch from the, from the number one use of Twitter, which is getting overly but legitimately irate about baking competitions. <laughs> totally legit. Um, and we're asking them instead to help help our research. Help, we're asking them to take part in research with us. And what we're doing is quite simple. We're saying, hey, if you make an error, can you just tweet about it? And then all you have to do is add the hashtag error diary. And then what happens, our website, errordiary.org, like, scans through Twitter, collects all of these tags up, and then we, as researchers, have this amazing database of slips and mistakes that are happening in the real world. And it's fantastic, because it's hilarious. <laughs> okay? Um, and it's also like good for science. Um, but um, I'm going to just talk, talk you through like a few examples of error diary that we've collected. I'm going to lead with my absolute all-time favorite error. It's maybe one of the most subtle and um, discreet errors that we collect, but it's absolutely my favorite. So we want people to be tweeting uh, about error diary. Occasionally, we get people tweeting about error dairy. <laughs> I love it. So, you know, either cows are tweeting from the workplace, um, or this is a rather hilarious meta error about error. <laughs> and that's why I love it. This is my absolute favorite instance of error diary. Um, okay, anyway, let's look at the actual things that we're collecting. So, the uh, errors we collect range from the mundane to from like using a pin code to enter to deactivate your burglar alarm or something like that. Um, let's do some learning. That is called an associative action slip, where you take one action that you would do in one circumstance and apply it to something similar but not right. So they range from the mundane, like this, to the kind of silly, like this, forgetting to remove the cocktail stick when ow, before me eating it into a burger. That um, is called an omission slip. From the mundane to the silly to the really, really silly. Um, that is uh, someone hurting themselves whilst air drumming to Africa by Toto. All of those came from my sister. She's an idiot. Uh. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to wrap up here with, with like a request because you guys can help us with our research, right? All I want you to do is the next time you do something completely insane and no one's around to see it, could you like tweet about it so that we could see it and then just add error diary to it? Um, and then we can collect it and then we can all have a massive laugh at your expense and also like science or something. Um, anyway, cool. Thank you so much uh, for listening. That's my Twitter handle if you want to get in touch or talk about error or anything like that. Thank you again very much. <laughs>
Amy Wiseman changes her Twitter avatar more often than is a normal for anyone on that service. <laughs> also, she changes her haircut three times in a four-month period. That's incredible. Sorry, I forgot what the talk was about. <laughs> I am very single. Um, ladies and gentlemen, our next act, you're going to love our next act. He's, uh, he's got his own show on Sky One, which you can watch. Had Has it been canned? Okay, or just, just watch it on an illegal thing. Don't do that. But it's fine, do that. Um, no, because the thing is, like, you're all super clever and can route it through Uzbekistan or something and never get caught. If I try anything like that, just as I type in his name, the police are outside. Because uh, I don't know how to do this stuff. Um, he's got a Wikipedia page. Ooh. His Wikipedia page does not start with a subtle put-down of him is a man whose Wikipedia page starts, is a geek comedian. I'm incredibly jealous of him. Please welcome to the stage, Tom Scott! Thank you, Steve. A um, <laughs> couple of things there. The reason I have a Wikipedia page is because I am friends with a Wikipedia administrator and that Wikipedia administrator wanted to troll me. Oh. <laughs> that, that's a... <laughs> Um, and, and the wonderful thing is, uh, I, I was on a technology show on Sky One about three, four years ago. Um, it was not popular enough for all the episodes to make it onto BitTorrent. <coughs> anyway, um, I also have a linguistics degree, which is why I'm actually up here. And uh, linguistics degrees are interesting. Linguistics slogan should basically be, we're a real science honest. Um, <laughs> Because it is. But, um, it genuinely is. There is all sorts of wonderful, impressive research out there uh, into the way the human brain works, into how we understand uh, sentences, into how computers can be, can be taught language. Uh, but I still have a BA at the end of my name, which I'm ever so slightly bitter about. <laughs> but it also means I have some good anecdotes. I'll be honest, that's pretty much all you get out of a linguistics degree if you're not going into uh, speech. I mean, there are two things you can get out of a linguistics degree. You know, you go into engineering, uh, and they say, oh, you can, you can go and do this, you can go and build spaceships, you can go and uh, talk to the world, you can go and build impressive buildings. There are two things you can do with a linguistics degree. Number one is speech therapy, which, don't get me wrong, is a very important part of the world. And number two is teach linguistics. <laughs> so I make websites for a living. Um, but it, as I say, leaves you with a few good anecdotes. And I don't have any slides because my support here is going to be you guys. Uh, and if I think that's the sound of everyone just kind of going, oh, God, audience interaction. <laughs> I'm not going to pull anyone up on stage, but I'm going to ask you to, uh, to use your mouths just a little. Not one dirty snicker at that. You're a lovely audience. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, I'm actually going to ask you to use your tongs a little. Um, one. Thank you. Lovely. Um, and what I'm going to explain is why Jonathan Ross can't pronounce his R's. I nearly said had trouble with his R's, but that's going to make more snickering. Um, one, again, it's you in the front. Um, why Jonathan Ross uh, can't pronounce his R's, and why you probably can't either. So what I want everyone to do here is just to say the word around. After three, so one, two, three. Around. That was really good. Normally, Steve, yeah. about half the audience does that, and the rest just go, mm -hmm. That was really clear. Well done on the warm up. Let's do it one more time. One, two, three. Around. Okay, now just the first bit, just the uh, ra. One, two, three. Around. Okay. When you make that R sound in there, what's your mouth doing? So do it one more time and concentrate, try and work out. And what normally happens is at least one person in the audience, if I say concentrate on how that's going, one person will just fail to say it because they'll kind of go, oh, yeah. <laughs> but let's try it. Okay, concentrate on which bits of your mouth are doing what. So one, two, three, around. No, not one person said the ound on the end. Normally there's one person who speaks something and goes, ound. <laughs> which is good because I didn't get to point at them this time. All right, so there are two ways that could be doing it. One is like an L, a la. I, I, I have trouble pronouncing this version, so Allah, ara, Allah, ara. Both times, it's going off the top of your mouth. So let's say that, Allah, ara, Allah, ara, and see if they sound the same to you. Allah, ara, Allah. Is your tongue doing the same thing? The other way is it's kind of like a weak V, like the. 
kind of like a v a r a a v a a r a So let's try that. A v a a r a a v a a r a Okay. There will be outliers. There'll be a few people in the room which neither of those work for. So let's try it. First of all, with an L. So a l a a r a a l a a r a a l a a r a And now let's try with a V. A v a a r a a v a Which one sounds more natural? If it sounds more natural that the same thing's happening when you do L and R, a l a a r a they're both tongue off the top of the mouth, raise your hand now. That is under half the audience. I'm expecting it to be under half, thank you, uh, because some people won't be able to work it out, and that's fine. Uh, and some, will, some people have other ways of doing it. Um, what about the V? A V, a V, hands up for that. That's actually a majority, that's actually more hands than the first one, which is interesting because technically that's a speech defect. <laughs> and the, now, now the first thing you drummed in, like very first lesson of any linguistics degree, is that you are meant to be descriptive, not prescriptive. You never, ever, ever say that this is the correct way to do something. You say that this is the standard way and that this is the non-standard way. And that's not a value judgment, it's just a different way of doing things. Technically, however, that's a speech defect. <laughs> and it's the same one I've got. Uh, I've always pronounced it that way. It's the same one Jonathan Ross has. It's just he never learned to cope with it. Because 50 years ago, that really was, that was known as a defect. That was something that was, if you went to elocution lessons, you were told absolutely not to do. It was trained out of you. Um, and people might even be able to notice you doing that. I'm guessing all of you who put the, the V up, you've, you've never, ever noticed any problem really saying the word R. No, one's, no one has gone, oh, that sounds weird to you. Maybe there's one in the room who actually had elocution lessons and, and knew that, but no one's noticed that. Maybe you've noticed that you have a little bit of trouble saying the word like practice. You hear, if I come in really close to the mic here, pra, you hear that coming out of my mouth there? If I say um, break, I, I haven't quite coped with it, but I'm nearly there. Some people will be able to pronounce this really clearly. I can't. Now, if you were the type who uh, does the L and the R, and by the way, for all those who never understood why a lot of East Asian languages continually confuse L and R, this is why. Because in those languages, they are the same sound. You can make either sound, it means the same thing. Um, that's the reason. And if you were like me growing up, you're like, oh, I don't understand why that happens. Because they, uh, bruh, it's like down there, L's up here. That's why it happens. And, well, for you guys, generally you haven't noticed. And here's the thing, 50 years ago, like I said, that was a defect. That was a really small thing. Right now, in this room, um, can I just get a quick, uh, just, all right. I think I can do this, because I'm mean, a geeky audience. All right, if you say it like the L, if you put your hand up for L, and you are, okay, so put your hand up for your L. Now drop that if you are under 30. Okay, there's still about five, six hands up. Okay, put your hand up for V. Drop it if you're under 30. Right. That is not what I expected. So, uh, <laughs> no, that's fair. Science! It works. Um, because here's the thing. No one noticed that happening. And this is going to be a slightly unsatisfying end, because ideally right now I would uh, unveil the mystery of why that's happened. But no one knows. It's the fastest speech defect that has ever been tracked around the English language. 50 years ago, virtually non-existent. 30 years ago, fairly prevalent kind of estuary English southeast. Now, we're at a hacker camp in the middle of the UK. I'm talking to people from all around Britain, and the defect is now the majority, is now the standard way of doing it. No one's noticed it. No one can explain it. No one knows why all of a sudden this is the way it's done. But it is. If anyone wants to start a linguistics degree and find an answer to that, there's probably a really good paper in it. But in the meantime, there's one thing I'll leave you with, which is this. I have seen it happening in the audience. People are still going... Bah, meh, bah, meh, bah, bah, bah. There's one thing I'll leave you with. All those people with the V, do you have trouble learning? Just uh, not going to ask for hands up. Just uh, let me know if, if you had trouble learning to roll your R's. As a lot of love. This is why. Because, and this, this blew my mind, first year of linguistics, doing phonetics, this is what I learned. Everyone who goes, it's really easy, you just kind of, just kind of do an R, but longer. Only works if it's off the top of your tongue. <laughs> is not the, how I learned to make an R. It's not how you guys learn to make an R. It's completely different. It is, 
it is basically putting your tongue like a little bit where an L is, maybe a little bit further back. Yeah, a little bit further back. And then just holding it there, letting air out, and just letting your tongue kind of go off the top of your mouth. Everyone here who has never been able to roll your R's before, tongue at the top of your mouth, like you're doing a L, move it back a little, leave a bit of a gap. Go for it. Love that sound. It's like a load of incompetent rattlesnakes. I'll leave you with that. I've been Tom Scott. Thank you very much. Tom Scott, ladies and gentlemen! I don't want to bring all of this back to my love life, but I have two love life related pronunciation of the letter R stories. Genuinely, once again, after a gig, someone tried to chat me up. She said to me, you have a very Edwardian R. That was it. She, she thought I'd be like, I've always been waiting for someone to say that to me. The other thing is I went out with someone who couldn't roll her R's, either that way or in the kind of way you do when you're really cold. She just couldn't do either of them. So I would spend my life going up to her and going, what noise does a lion make? And she would go, grr. And I'd say, what do you do when it's cold? And she would go, bruh. <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, uh, it made me far happier than it should have done. Didn't we enjoy Tom? Yeah. Someone go and put self-described on his Wikipedia page. <laughs> Our next act. Uh, he is one of the organisers of Science Show Off in Bristol with me. Uh, he's a big star of the YouTube scene. It, apparently that's possible. I'm so far behind. Like, I'm barely, like, Tom was Sky One. I was like, what is Sky One? Like, well, you guys probably, anyway, you have. Yes. Uh, right, so he's a big star of the YouTube scene. You can go and see him explaining why he's just blown something up in a thousand different ways. Uh, he was nearly a Blue Peter presenter until they realized that modern cameras are incapable of filming three haircuts simultaneously. Would you please welcome to the stage, Ross Exter! I'm five foot five, this is unfair. <laughs> Hello, Electromagnetic Field Festival! Hello. So today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, poison. Uh, so we're going to start off with this person, Cleopatra. Can anyone here tell me how Cleopatra died? You're wrong. You're wrong. It's a, it's a common misconception that she died by an asp bite. Um, but an asp bite isn't very romantic. There's a lot of diarrhea and vomiting involved. It takes hours and hours to die from an asp bite. So instead, uh, nowadays, we think that she died from a cocktail of hemlock, wolfsbane, and opium, which sounds brilliant. Um, <laughs> And uh, we're going to be talking about poisons today. Now, if you are going to get any ideas uh, from this talk, I urge you, please, please don't poison anyone. I mean, not, not only can it end up pretty messy, but you're very likely to get caught. So um, I want you to remember uh, this guy here. So this is um, so US Sergeant Marcus Merrimont. Now, back in 1958, uh, he was on duty, and he was... Uh, out on tour, and he was always coming back to visit uh, his family at home. And he was trying to poison his wife. And this is what he's most famous for. And in fact, he was famous for being really shit at poisoning his wife. Because <laughs> he wanted to run away with his girlfriend, but couldn't face the shame of the divorce in the 1950s. No, no, no. Perfectly fine with murder, though. Murder, good. Divorce, no, no, no. So uh, each time he would come home on leave from tour, he would try and poison his wife with arsenic. He would fail time and time again. And eventually, he succeeded. Yes, well done. Uh, but he almost got away with it, except for the fact that toxicologists looked at his wife's hair. And what they were able to see were bands of arsenic in her hair, and each one corresponded to a point in time when he visited home from tour. <laughs> so toxicologists are really good at their jobs. If you're going to kill someone, don't poison them. It's a really bad way of doing it. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about something which is incredibly toxic. <laughs> boo, boo, yes, boo. 
We're going to start with something that's really poisonous. And the reason I want to talk about the Daily Mail to start with is because I'm, ins I'm inspired by their ongoing campaign to categorize every known object in the world into things which cause cancer and things which don't cause cancer. <laughs> Except we're going to have a go at doing this with poisons. So what I'm going to do is show you a list of various different things. We've got apples, vodka, water, potatoes, daffodils, chocolate. I want you to take five seconds to think about this. Which one of these do you think are poisonous and which ones do you think are non-poisonous? Okay, go. Four, three, two, one. All right, so keep that in your mind. Here, here's the answer. Did, so you guys got it. Did anyone else get this? Yes. Everything is poisonous. Now, the reason for this is because all of these things have something in common. They're all made of chemicals. Now, some people out there would, would have you believe that chemicals are bad. Chemicals are very bad. We want you to have our alternative natural things. You can even get something like this. This is a chemistry set. With what the fuck is this? 60 fun activities with no chemicals. Now, either this is a box of lies, or you're going to have a very disappointed child on your hands when they open this up to discover a pure vacuum on the inside. <laughs> Th this is a more realistic lab environment, though. I'll give them that. You know, so sorry, Jimmy, there's no funding this year. No, no chemicals for you. So <laughs> let's start with uh, the least poisonous thing from our list. So we're going to start with water. Uh, <laughs> back in 2007, a woman called Jennifer Strange poisoned herself with water. Uh, this is very sad, obviously. But uh, it means that we uh, don't have to do clinical trials for these kinds of things, because there are idiots out there to do the work for us. <laughs> when toxicologists measure uh, poison in something, they like to come up with something called the lethal dose 50. And um, oh yeah, everything is made of chemicals, so we, we all got that message. So LD50 uh, means the dose which is required to kill half of a given population. Um, so Jennifer Strange was taking part in something called a water drinking competition. Now, now where in the world could have, a <laughs> could have the water for a, a water drinking competition? Does anyone have a guess as to where in the world this could possibly be? America. Yes. America, fuck yeah. <laughs> Uh, Jennifer Strange was taking part in this water drinking competition to win a Nintendo Wii. <laughs> She's doing half the work for me. She's writing all the jokes. Um, now, the median lethal dose for water is absolutely huge. It's about 90 grams per kilogram. In other words, to kill everyone over this side of the room, you guys are fine, 50% so of the audience here, would be about six and a half liters of water. So that's absolutely huge. Let's compare this to a few of the other things on our list. Uh, you'd need two kilograms of sugar. If you think you could stomach that much sugar in one go, you can have a go at doing that as well, if you feel free. Now, nutmeg, about 300 grams of nutmeg would kill you. Uh, that's about 10 of these little pots of nutmeg that you might get. That's really committed. Well done if you do this. <laughs> Ethanol. So who here is drinking tonight? Yes, very good, very good. So um, about 621 milliliters of ethanol would kill you. So that's pure ethanol, by the way, not just a pint and a bit. Some of you are very confused, Nick. I've, I've had way more than this. I'm a superhero. No. <laughs> no, it's pure ethanol, so it's just over a pint. Ooh, my favorite of the drugs, caffeine. It's brilliant. It's so good. But you need about 100 cups of coffee to kill you. Once again, you need to be very committed for that one. Potatoes. Does anyone here not eat the green bits on uh, crisps? You idiots. <laughs> So those, there's the myth that those bits are poisonous and they will kill you. Um, and the reason for this is, bec is because potatoes contain something called solanine, um, which basically fucks with the mitochondria in your cells. You bleed internally, shit yourself, and die. Um, 
and the green parts of the potato contain more of this uh, solanine. But in order for you to have even enough to reach the median lethal dose 50, you would need 10 potatoes raw. So if, uh, once again, you can eat 10 raw potatoes, well done, well done to you. Braver person than me. Daffodils. Now, they look all Welsh and cuddly, but um, they <laughs> they're also poisonous as well. So their official name, Narcissus, comes from the Greek uh, legend Narcissus. So he fell in love with his reflection, and he stayed there for so long staring at his reflection that he died lying there. So these have the Latin name Narcissus, but a handful of daffodil bulbs, bulbs would certainly make you very, very sick, if not kill you. Apples. Now, I might have heard that apples contain cyanide. That's because of this compound here. It's something called amygdalin. And you might notice that at this little location here, we have some cyanide. So how much of an apple would you need to eat? Well, the amygdalin is actually in the seeds of the apple. You'd need about 100 grams, and you'd need to grind all of that up. And from that, you get about 200 milligrams of, amyg of uh, amygdalin, and then your body breaks that down to produce about 10 milligrams of cyanide. And about 50 milligrams is considered lethal, but a few drops would certainly do the trick, so you can give that a go as well. Now, this guy, <laughs> this guy screams a color of, bruv, I will fuck you up. <laughs> you don't want to get too close to this guy. And that's because out of his skin, he leaks this compound here, batrachotoxin, which just sounds so badass anyway. So about 10 milligrams of that as well will do the trick for you. But this leads us on to the most poisonous and deadly compound in the world. Would you guys like to see this compound? Yes. This is the deadliest thing on the planet. Now, I'm not talking about Pete Burns. I'm talking about what he and millions of other people have voluntarily done to their faces. Botox. So the, <laughs> what causes Botox is a bacterium called botulinum. Now, uh, botulinum produces a neurotoxin which paralyzes some of the muscles and causes a bit of inflammation, makes you look very young and very luscious, like you haven't got any wrinkles. And the type that's used in the cosmetics industry is type C, so that's absolutely fine. But in producing all of this, the botulinum also produces a type A of this neurotoxin. Now, this is produced in vast quantities every year as a consequence of the cosmetics industry. But the lethal dose for this type A botulinum toxin is 70 nanograms. In other words, to have, if you, well, if you took half a kilogram of this botulinum toxin and distributed it evenly enough, it would not only kill everyone in this room, everyone in Milton Keynes, everyone in the UK, it would kill every person on the planet <laughs> with just half a kilogram of this. So that has been Poisons, Ivan Ross. Thank you all very much. Ross Exton, ladies and gentlemen. Subtle self-publicity, I quite like that. Let's get rid of that. Um, uh, you enjoying the show so far? Yeah. Well, I have to say, if you've, if you've enjoyed this, we've got one more act coming up. If you have enjoyed this, uh, there will be a science show off in Birmingham on September the 6th. There's one in London on September the 16th. There's one in Bristol on September the 18th. Uh, if you want to you know, come to science show-off shows or geek show-off shows, go to, we have our web, which is scienceshow-off.org. We are facebook.com slash scienceshow-off. We are twitter.com slash scienceshow-off. That's also the account I use to tweet when I'm drunk. Uh, and anything, basically, if you stand in your bathroom and say science show-off three times, I will appear. <laughs> the trick is to put down a pentagram of talc before you say it, because then I'm trapped, because I'm frightened of its drying properties. I worry about it. Anyway, uh, so that's everything you need to know. Uh, there's a little bit of setting up going on, so I'm going to wait for the setting up to be all happy before I introduce it. The setting up is happy. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready to meet your final geek show off of the night? Many of you will know him as the man from NTK.net. Those of you too young to remember him, that was beta.com before beta.com existed. Those of you too young to remember beta.com, it was BuzzFeed before BuzzFeed existed. 
Those of you too young to remember BuzzFeed, you are so lucky. <laughs> I'm going to do my one BuzzFeed joke. Who invented BuzzFeed? Paul Simon, with the song 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. That's what I'm leaving on. Just so you know, that's where we're going. No, uh, I'm going to bring him his microphone stand so we can do this properly. Um, oh, there is more. They said it was. Well, I, I brought you my slides. Oh, slides, of course. Dave's brought his slides in a PDF. Can I get a boo? Yes. No, no. It says, it says not, not in a PDF in capital letters. Admittedly, the email has the word PDF in, but it is preceded by not in a. Uh. Anyway, right, I'm going to stop trolling him and heckling him from the stage, which is the harshest kind of heckle, which means you're going to have to show him double love to make up for what a git I am. Are you ready to do that, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. Please welcome the stage, Dave Green! Thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm very pleased this is working. Go on, like, is that loud enough? Do you want more? Yeah, a bit more? Yeah. Louder. Let's have, like... And I assume you all know this. Here we go. I'm going to have to do it weirdly. Sweet dreams are made of this. Who am I to disjoin in if you know it? It's on the screen. The world and the seven sea. Everybody's looking for something. Yes, they are. Some of them want to use. Some of them just want to be you. Boy. Some of them, they want to amuse you, yeah. Some of them just want to be amused. And here's my kids. Oh, yeah, here we go. Oh, is that something like that? There we go. So you, you've done brilliantly. Give yourselves a round of applause and I'll pretend it's for me. That's good. So keep, keep it up and I'll... Um... Oh, that's... Let, let's assume that, that like, I've, I've got control of it again. Hi, everyone. So thank you. You've been, you've been very indulgent so far. My name's Dave Green. As Steve uh, generously pointed out, um, oh, I mean, this is what I'm talking about. Um, this is... Uh, and, and, and like these are old slides. Every time I do this talk, this amazing guitar that you could build yourself gets cheaper than the £40 I claim on here. So uh, that's fake Dave Green on Twitter. Museum of Techno is my friend Dave, who'll be uh, uh, appearing later, who's in, um, who's in my band. Uh, if people do know me uh, from NTK, I don't know if many of you can read this, NTK just found things on the internet and, and made fun of it, so, which was radical in, in those days. This is my favourite. This is from the uh, games magazine Edge, uh, where clearly they got a press release saying that a new Cyber Pet, which is popular in, I think, 97 is where this at, the, the uh, budget for the new Cyber Pet Fin Fin uh, but from Fujitsu was a ludicrous $70 billion. Now, that clearly... This was, a, this was a press release talking about 70 billion yen, but like Edge, Edge hadn't bothered with that. They thought, oh, 70 billion dollars. That does sound ludicrous, doesn't it? Like, uh, what idiots Fujitsu are. Yes, 70 billion dollars, uh, even then, it was the gross national product of Portugal. <laughs> um, and and, and uh, you've you got to wonder what, what was uh, Fujitsu's business model with that. Presumably, there's, you know, maybe seven billion people in the world. If the profit margin was 10 dollars, um, then uh, if they sold one to everyone in the world, they'd get close to breaking even. I, f I, I, I find that hilarious. Anyway, what I do now, among other things, this is my band, Fake Bit Polytechnic, who those of you who haven't planned your evening uh, better will, will know are coming on later. This is, again, my, my friend Dave Pate there on the mic. This little red thing, you see the red thing near his, his foot? Does anyone know what that is? Oh, Stompbox, we've got some guesses. Um, uh, 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 Dave runs a website called the Museum of Techno, which uh, is, is still live, and I, I urge you to check out. Here, he's, um, he's, he's playing the keyboard, um, but, you know, and he's, he's very jealous of me playing this guitar hero, this child's guitar hero guitar over in the corner, not going through that massive Marshall amplifier at all. So, um, we found, like, uh, did anyone play the rock band Guitar Hero games? Yeah, how, how recently? In the last year? In the 2000s? All right, okay, anyway, no, so um, 
that they brought out loads of loads of these very sturdy uh, um, uh, peripherals, and and then uh, instantly ran out of money because uh, pe pe people stopped downloading the songs. However, the Kitar, which I'm modelling for you now, is uh, remarkably resilient and out also outputs MIDI, which is uh, a useful detail. In, in the FAQ from the key from the Kitar, people say, "Can I use the um, if the Kitar is a real instrument? Why doesn't it make any sound?" And then it goes on to it. Do people know what MIDI is? Show of hands. It's, it's instructions for, for other musical instruments. So that's why it doesn't make sound of its own. Um, what Dave Pate was doing, uh, he's got, uh, this is a Nord micromodular synthesizer. No one guessed it. I'm not disappointed. It's very obscure. So uh, he's here. You can see him. He's gaffer taped it onto the bottom of his guitar um, you, using, uh, yeah, well, obviously gaffer tape. And, um, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, mid, the MIDI interface is just running through that. That's us, uh, uh, that's us not, not going down very well at the Musical Comedy Awards earlier this year. Um, I, wa I didn't have one of those synths, so I, 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 I thought, oh, be, this would make some brutal chip tune noises, but it looks like it's $100. Um, I couldn't understand the hardware for the SID emulator shield for the Arduino, which is disappointing. Uh, but I did discover that there's uh, what they call the Mozzie Sound Synthesis Library for the Arduino. Any, any, any Arduino programmers in? Yeah, like any Raspberry Pi people in? Uh, the same people, interesting. <laughs> anyway, the great, 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 great thing about Mozzie is it, it does a lot of the synthesis stuff for you. So, and that's an Arduino Nano. Everyone knows what an Arduino looks like. I could have, anyway. Um, this is the, uh, the, uh, the other innovative part of my design is I'm not very good at soldering, so I try to do it all. Uh, and, and like the, the, the weird spidery creation over, over on the right is, is a filter that apparently, apparently you don't need, and uh, we, we seem to be getting away with without. And then this is just me taking, this is just, this is raw kind of like serial data coming, coming in from the, from the MIDI keytar that I, I'm, I'm just putting into various uh, nano outputs. Um, Oh, here we go. Uh, last time, l the last Geek Show Off, I showed some, some C code, and everyone went, Ooh. And I wasn't sure if it's because they don't normally have C code at Geek Show Off, or because my C++ was so bad. <laughs> um, re reassuringly, I, I, I feel I've, I've, I've selected a non-controversial uh, segment of my code here. This, this is how good the MIDI libraries are uh, for the Arduino. Basically, you can just specify a lot of things that happen, and then radically, as you can see, when I press this button here, it'll start. Yeah, it'll go back to um, "Sweet Dreams Are Made of This." Um, these are my other. These are my other patterns. This is quite a dangerously large array to have in an Arduino. Uh, I, I'd, I'd like to talk to someone about that afterwards. But I've also got. Um, so, any any sight readers in the audience will know this one. Oh yeah, it's octaves. So I, I use this for kind of Blue Monday or um, I'll, oh, I've got like. <laughs> there we go. Um, the other, like, oh, I'll, I'll, oh, so, so that, that's, that's, I think, more of a, maybe more of a try, a, a sawtooth wave. The, the other techno innovation. Oh, yeah. So. I don't know what that's doing, actually. Oh, it's back on that again. So here, I'm, I, like, I'm, I'm controlling the duty cycle of the square wave for all you synthesizer fans. So there, there it's quite strong. And there, there it's quite reedy. I was very pleased with that. Uh, like, uh, <laughs> um, and then this, this is doing it automatically to give you a kind of techno beat to it. No, it's not doing it. It's quite... Perhaps it's quite a subtle effect. Anyway, and um, the, other th the other thing I was very pleased with um, is that, uh, uh, like, the, the other, the, the most, uh, what's the other classic of, uh, uh, effect from techno music? Anyone got any, got any favorites? Anyone, anyone you, you can shout them out, you can just bleep them. I thought it's the, you know, it's that kind of, it, it's, the, it's the delay. Is, it, is that what you were gonna say? It's the delay where you make a note like you make a note on the beat and then it continues to repeat on the beat. Now the Arduino clearly, yes, he agrees with me. Thank you, sir. What? Shing? Oh, sorry. I thought it was, it was this guy. I was waving. I was pointing at this guy in front. Yes. He was. He was blocking you. Anyway, so back with the techno. Uh, um, the. Uh, 
So uh, the Arduino has only got 32 kilobytes of, uh, of RAM, so you can't have a proper uh, uh, echo or delay, or, or, or delay loop in it. What you can do is take the, the, uh, take the envelope of the note and just kind of cheat it, because if you know what the BPM of the track is, you can take, uh, as, as it's decaying like that, you can probably, I don't know, all the top, uh, the top four bits or something, so it will kind of spike like that, and I think that will do it. Yeah, you see? Uh, it sounds better lower down. And that's, I think, so that's now. I, I like, uh, uh, I like the, and this is, this is my kind of what time is love tribute. <laughs> I don't know, does anyone know the words to this? It's, it, it's, it's a bit rap orientated. I don't know how long I've done now, so I, I'm, I'm getting the wrap-up noise. See what else I've got in here. Any, anyone, know, anyone know this? From, um, from the game Spy Hunter. Oh, I've got... A... Oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah. There we go. It's surprisingly difficult to play at this angle. Um, little trick, little surprise there. When I came to the EMF camp, I thought it was named that after the Epson motherfunkers who had a hit in 1990 with this one hit wonder. I mean, I'm sure you know it. Oh, no, not that. Yeah, here we go. So who knows this? So does anyone remember EMF? So, I, and again, handily, I've got the words, so we, we've, got, we've got no excuse. I think I'll bring, I'll bring up the bass line when we, when we go to one, two, one, two, three. You burden me with your problems. You'd have me tell no lies. You'd always ask me what it's all about. Don't listen to my replies. You say to me, I don't talk enough. When I do, I'm a fool. These times I've spent, I've realized. I'm going to shoot through and leave you. These things, you say. Your purple prose just gives you away the things you say. You're unbelievable. Yeah. Thanks. I felt that was mostly me. Yeah, uh, does anyone know the rap at the end? Shall we? Seemingly lossless, don't mean you can ask us. Pushing down the relative, bringing out your higher self. Think of the fine times, pushing down the better few. Instead of bringing out the blues to want, the world and everything you anger to. Brace yourself with the grace of ease. I know this world ain't what it seems. It's what? It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's so unbelievable. So literally, I, I think you can probably to fade, just fade this down now, because um, I have no way, I have very few ways of controlling it up here. Um, yeah, it's still working. So um, I think we'll, we'll, there'll probably about, be about 10 minutes, well, Steve will come on, then there'll be about uh, 10 minutes set up for the full electro-funk experience that is Fake Bit Polytechnic. Th thank you very much. You, you've, been, you've been beyond credibility uh, this evening. Thank you. Green, ladies and gentlemen! <laughs> Give me a cheer if you've enjoyed Geek Show! Yeah. You've got one job left to do. I'm going to shout the names of everyone you've seen tonight. I want you to clap and cheer so loud you can't hear any of them. Oh, and you've got to move all the chairs after we do this. What was is? How far back do you want them to move them? Reasonably far. Be judges yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight you saw Cindy Regalado, you saw Sarah Wiseman, you saw Tom Scott, you saw Ross Exton, and right at the end you saw Dave Green, ladies and gentlemen. I've been Steve Cross. Go from this place and lead brilliant and successful lives. Good night! <laughs>